Well, if I'm not mistaken, it's time to have a little meeting in my office again for the Thursday morning Bible study. Good to see you. Really good to see you. And uh, I've got a few things here that we're going to be talking about in regards to this coming Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles and others in Jerusalem. So uh, my voice is a little hoarse here today. I hope I'll be able to hang in here. Uh, let's pray together as we begin. Oh God, on this day, you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit, that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. That's the prayer that we'll have on Sunday when you join us on live stream. So let's see here. We're going to be talking about the book of Acts today, Acts chapter 2, which gives the story of the uh, the, the uh, marvelous day in Jerusalem when the, the wind and the, or the roar of the wind and the, the fire comes into the, uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there's a, also from 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul's letter that talks about the variety of spiritual gifts. And in John's gospel, uh, another text that's a little brief, but it will talk about how Jesus breathes the spirit upon his disciples. You know, I got to think, uh, thinking that I should put this on because it is a red day on Sunday. And so I'm going to put this on if I can get it on right. Here we go. I didn't practice this part. So this is the stole. And if I'm not mistaken, you've got here what is the Greek letters, Cairo, which is for uh, Christ, meaning Christ. Over here, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You can read about that in the book of Revelation. And here is a sign of the, the, the fire and the, the Holy Spirit on this stole. So I will keep this on and uh, be inspired. Also, look what I have back here. I've got all of these candles, 12 of them lit. Uh, a little bit of a fire hazard in my office, perhaps, but I've been waiting for you to arrive, and now we will light the final one. So I've got 11 lit, and I will now light the 12th candle, if I can just get this wick to cooperate, which I don't seem to be able to do. Here it goes. This Bible study might get a lot longer here by just trying to light this candle, but there it is. So. The 12 candles burning and the story of Pentecost. So let's begin by looking at this story from the book of Acts. And it's in the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. You'll want to do a little reading prior to this to understand that this is the, the day that the Lord had promised that he would send the Holy Spirit upon the lives of those who will carry on the work of Christ himself. Yeah, Pentecost was actually a, a Jewish harvest festival. It marked the 50th day after Passover. For those of us who celebrate Easter, we've got the 50 days of rejoicing. And so in this context, Pentecost becomes the culmination of this Easter celebration. And we uh, talk about this story that is read every year from the book of Acts. And it was written by Luke, of course. Let me begin to read this text, and then I'll say a little bit as we go on. Uh, turn to your Bibles, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, let's just stop there for a moment, because uh, this, this story that is unfolding before us will be the beginning of the movement of what we call the early church. And notice that uh, the wind and the fire, we'll say a little bit more about that because in the early part of the scripture, you'll find out that the wind was blowing across creation. I'll make reference to that maybe a little bit later on from the book of Genesis. 
And of course, uh, it, it even says in the scripture that Jesus will baptize with, uh, you know, with the fire of the spirit, if you will. So we are set up here uh, for this story now. As I pick it up in verse 5, it says, Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them was speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. <laughs> let, let me tell you, you know, on whoever is the lector on Pentecost has quite a, a challenge set out before them because you've got all of these places that are listed where people are have come to Jerusalem, and now the Holy Spirit is falling upon the nations, it seems like, right? You need to remember that this was still a rather uh, a smaller landscape than what we know as the entire world today, because this landscape where the nations around the Mediterranean, mostly Turkey, uh, and then it went out into, of course, uh, what would be modern day Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and so on. But it was kind of confined around the Mediterranean world and extended all the way to Rome, where, of course, Paul would be proclaiming uh, in his final days. So this is just a, a story of great mystery uh, of how this comes into the lives of the people. And what we see is that now Peter is... One of the 12, he's the bold one, of course, who seems to be always ready to do something unexpectedly, and he's going to give a sermon. He breaks out into what really is the first sermon that we find beyond Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, but the first sermon that uh, we see in the book of Acts in the New Testament. So let me read on. I'm in verse 14 of, again, chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone, hear this, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Obviously, this is a story of great hope. The Spirit of God comes to restore all of creation and to restore God's people into what we pray would be a greater unity, right? That all the languages of, of people are wrapped together in God's Spirit at work in many cultures and many parts of the world. That's really important for us to think about in today's landscape, right? Where we sometimes still find that we're alienating people and, 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 and drawing judgments upon people who are different than us in different parts of the world, different cultures. And here in this story today, we have the opportunity to see that God is wrapping us together, saying that the Holy Spirit is at work in all of our lives, even yours, by the way. So we have to think about that, don't we, in terms of a greater unity. Um, that text, of course, uh, in Peter's sermon, makes reference to the prophet Joel. Uh, we read the prophet Joel on Ash Wednesday, 
I think it's the only time in the lectionary it shows up. But Joel was a what was called one of the minor prophets. It doesn't mean a minor message, but he he began to proclaim in a time where there was a, a plague of locusts in the land, and he saw this as the coming of God's judgment. But judgment always gives way to restoration and hope for those people who find them, their lives remained in the, remaining in the promises of God. So that's really important for us to recall as well. You know, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to take this on Sunday, um, but I do know that, that that text from Acts chapter 2 will be uh, a very bedrock for what we discuss and what I have the chance to speak about in the sermon. Uh, the psalm for uh, Sunday is Psalm 104, and we'll probably read a little bit about this psalm before the service, right at the beginning when the service begins. It has a, a wonderful phrase in it. How manifold are your works, O Lord. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And then this psalm begins to speak about God's creation. And there is this refrain in verse 30. You send forth your spirit and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. Now, just think about this for a minute. We, we realize the Spirit was there in the beginning. I'm, I'm going to pull out my old black Bible here, and I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first few verses. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God, ah, there it is, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. This wind of God, the Spirit was present in the beginning. The Hebrew word is actually ruach. You have to have it in the back of your throat when you say it. Ruach. And it, it is the Spirit of God present at the very beginning. This same Spirit that, that shows up on this day of Pentecost to, to bring a new creation, a new, uh, a new promise to the people that, uh, that are living in the world at that time and for us as well. So I, I think about that. You know, there's a beautiful hymn. I like music, you know that. Some of you uh, might remember the hymn, Spirit of Gentleness. And this, this harkens back to what I just read from Psalm 104, when it talks about how the Spirit was present in the creation. Uh, here's how the song goes. Do I dare sing it? I'll try. I've got a bad voice here today. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. Well, the, the spirit is going to stir things up. You can, you can bank on that. And then it goes on, the spirit moved over the waters, called to the deep coaxed up the mountains and called the valleys from sleep. And it's just a beautiful text. I won't go into it all. We don't have time. But again, it's called Spirit of Gentleness, and it's hymn number 396 in the ELW. Um, another text on Sunday is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, talk about the spiritual gifts of God. And of course, Paul will have the crescendo in the 13th chapter when Paul says the greatest gift of the Spirit is the Spirit of love. Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. Now, on Sunday, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 uh, through 13, and I'm not going to read this all the way through verbatim, but Paul is helping the church in Corinth understand the relationship between God-given unity and spirit created diversity. That is, everybody has different gifts, but the gifts, says St. Paul, are to be used for the common good of all humanity. So in verse 3, Paul writes, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I got to think about this for a minute because all of a sudden Martin Luther comes to mind here. How do we come to know God in Christ? Well, the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ, teaches us about Christ, brings Christ into our lives. Um, in Luther's small catechism, I'm going to try to do this from memory. I just think about it right now. 
in the third article of the Apostles' Creed about the work of the Holy Spirit, um, Luther says, I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the one true church. And then he speaks about day after day we come together. The Spirit brings us together as people in Christ to celebrate his presence and the gifts that he has poured out upon us. And, and so when he talks about the different kinds of spiritual gifts, wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, various kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Um, they're, they're, they're listed out here, and it says all of these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. Now, I got to tell you, there, there's a time in the church, there's always time when the church has conflicts, right? And uh, sometimes the church was split by one of these gifts of the Spirit called glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. And I'm not going to go into that today a great deal, but um, the, these utterances that would come from a people that were filled by the Holy Spirit were sometimes signs of great faith. And yet, if it wasn't interpreted, Paul says, it's kind of useless. So he also prayed for the spirit of interpretation. Uh, you're, you're, you don't necessarily become a super Christian just because you speak in tongues. But sometimes the church got a little divided over this issue, seeming to think, well, these people have greater spiritual gifts because they're speaking in tongues. No, Paul says that all gifts are important. Your gift as, is as important as anyone else's because it's uniquely given to you, right? There's no other you. You've been created by God. And so it's important for you to discover that uh, you have God's gift upon you. And then Paul says this, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. I just can't lift up enough, enough this fact that the Spirit wants us to be drawn together as brothers and sisters, not to be alienated one from each other. And in this, this day right now, of course, there's so much polarization going on that it's, it's, uh, it gets kind of ugly sometimes, doesn't it? So we as a church hope that we can uh, speak to that and, and make a difference as you can as well. Well, you know, I gotta. I need to tell you something else here at this point. I'm watching my clock. Discerning spiritual gifts. It's not always easy for you to do that on your own. I think it's important for you to realize that many times the community will help you discern what your gift is. <laughs> Can I, let me give you a little kind of a funny example. Uh, once again, I'm going to tell a hardware store story because my dad ran the hardware store small town in Iowa. And of course, as a young uh, kid in, in my teenage years, uh, I went down to help out and work at the hardware store. Well, that was kind of a mistake because uh, I didn't know much about hardware at all. Maybe, maybe part of it was I didn't know if I wanted to know, but when somebody came in and shopped and my dad would say, can you go help this person? I found out that in the hardware business, I wasn't much help. I mean, so dad had me sweep the floors and do some things that I could do a little bit better. You know, I have to hand it to my dad, though. Uh, I think he knew that. <laughs> I think my dad knew that about me, too. And so on Monday nights, my dad would always put me in the station wagon. We drive over to Spencer, Iowa. And I did two things there. My dad took me to my guitar lessons where I, I learned to play the guitar and sing. And then he also took me out to a radio station. It was KICD in Spencer, Iowa. And he let me listen to the announcers on the radio because my dad, I think, knew. He helped me discern that my future was not in the hardware store. My future would probably be more in uh, what turned out to be in some time in the radio industry and my love for music and the way that that, that has assisted me, uh, I hope in uh, the ministry that I'm a part of. So uh, let me uh, drink to dad here, a glass of water. 
but remembering um, how dad helped me discern my gifts. And it is probably the case that you would find that in your life as well. The gospel on Sunday. Oh, this is beautiful. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. And I'm going to read this to you. Uh, notice I have it printed out on paper because I scratch things down here. But John chapter 20, uh, the risen Jesus appears to his disciples, offering them a benediction, a commission, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the same uh, chapter where you find the story of Thomas, and, and uh, this actually precedes that story of Thomas. In the 19th verse, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, by the way, this is when uh, Jesus had been raised from the dead, the day that Mary Magdalene saw the empty tomb and met uh, Jesus, who he, she thought was the gardener. All right, so it's on that day. This is, not, this is not like the Pentecost story in Acts, which is 50 days down the road. No, this is on the day of the resurrection itself. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then his disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This was, oh my goodness, Jesus comes to the disciples and he's the very wind of God. He breathes upon his disciples and and gives them new life. Uh, and he, in this, in this Holy Spirit, he actually gives them a commission in their own right uh, to be sent as he was sent into the world. So the disciples now become those who spread the word and the love of Christ into the world. And of course, there's also mention in here about the forgiveness of sins. And uh, again, in John's gospel, it's just imperative to know that John is not ever talking about what it means to have that checklist of going through and counting up uh, what the sins are. The major focus is for John in his gospel, sin is unbelief. And so Jesus wants to make sure that the disciples are set free from not believing and calling them into belief, calling the disciples into belief so that they will spread the news of Christ into the world and, if you will, set the world free, set the people free from sin and bondage and, and get them uh, traveling on a new landscape of, of life, as, as Jesus would say, that is the abundant life that they will find in him. Well, that's just kind of a tickler, I guess, of what you might uh, expect this Sunday as we come together. Again, go back and look at these texts from uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right at the early part, and then in the 20th chapter of St. John. You know, I have one other book here this morning, and I'm going to use it as we close today, because this is the, uh, the hymn book. Uh, that I received when I was a confirmation student. My parents gave me this. It says, to Steve, from mother and dad, confirmation, May 26th, 1968. Yes, I do like to reveal my age to you. I just turned 67, by the way. Now, uh, this hymn book uh, only had about a, a four-year lifespan because by 1972, we went into the green hymn book called the LBW, and now, of course, ah, yes, the next one, the ELW, which doesn't have the song here that I'm going to end with today. I can still remember my mother playing this on the organ, and I think you will recognize it. I'm actually going to sing it in what sounds like the old King's English here. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew that I may love what thou dost love, 
and do what thou wouldst do. Now there's several verses to this. But I will tell you that I have this in my head, and I give it to you now so that you'll carry it in your, your head and your heart, that when a time comes, maybe even this week, when you find yourself in a difficult moment, and we certainly have those now, don't we, with the continuing of this pandemic, uh, I pray for you, you pray for me and, and for this community, and especially for those in need. But if you find yourself in a moment where you just say, oh, I feel like I'm out of hope, think about this song and say to yourself, breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love as you have loved and do what you would do. And I promise you, it's actually not me, it's Jesus, who says when you call upon him, he will breathe into you, into you the spirit of life, his very spirit, into your life. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you the peace that passeth all understanding for those of us who keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Blow, Spirit, blow into the lives of all of you. I'm Pastor Steve, and I'll see you on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm.